Hello, bird nerds. I'm Grant Williams. This is the bird emergency. And da -na -na -na. I think today we might be going into controversy corner or maybe even conspiracy corner. Let's see where it leads us. My guest today is Mr. Hamish Cumming. And I'll let Hamish uh, give, give himself a, a, a title, a moniker. But Hamish is a landowner in Western Victoria, and Western Victoria is the last place in Victoria where you are likely, if you are lucky, to see a brolga. Hi, Hamish. How are you? Thanks for being part of the bird emergency. Good, Graham. Thanks for having us on. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Now, uh, dear listener, Hamish... Um, and one of his uh, one of his group, I think, reached out to me and said, "Hey, why don't you talk about wind farms and brolgas?" And I thought, "Hey, I've always wanted to talk about wind farms, especially since Jeff Jeff uh, Kennett's uh, beautiful quote about one of my favourite birds, the orange-bellied parrot, when he referred to it as a trumped-up corella." <laughs> when there was a big controversy about wind farms in South Gippsland, um, Bald Hills, I believe, was the, the project at that time. Now, Hamish, why are you worried about wind farms in Western Victoria? Okay. Um, the, because of um, the brogas uh, being raised to endangered now, um, uh, there's not that many of them. The argument that some people put forward is there's you know six or seven hundred, but they can never count more than four or five hundred when they do their counts. Um, but when when you look at a population that small and they're genetically isolated from the brogues at the north, they're different. They behave differently. They flock differently. Um, they're, they're a species that that needs saving. And if you've only got, say, 600 and some are old, they're monogamous, they lose their partners, they don't breed, some are young, you've got about 200 breeding pairs. And as wind farms have been built in Western Victoria, the one thing that's shone out is as soon as they're built, the brogas don't successfully nest within five kilometres of the turbines. And one company claimed that they had, but when we researched it, we found that it was the year before the turbines were commissioned. And then they claimed again they had, and then we researched that and found they nested 5Ks outside the wind farm and came in when it was stopped for maintenance. So there's at least 12 wind farms now operating in Brolga habitat. And all of those 12s have displaced or killed the Brolgas for a five kilometer radius. That means of the 200 breeding pairs that are left, 50 nest sites have been lost in eight years and they're planning to build more and more wind farms in the remaining Brolga habitat. And it's it's just one of those things. You keep building them, you keep displacing them or killing them and you'll exterminate them. One of the problems I've had with researching this subject, Hamish, is that there is not much available literature available to the public. But before we kick into that problem, let's just talk about brolgas for for a minute. Um, international um, listeners will probably not know what a brolga is. A brolga is one of the two species of crane that live in Australia. The brolga lives uh, widely dispersed on the eastern uh, side of the country but is the only one of the cranes that lives in the state where Hamish and I live, which is in Victoria, which is the, the southeast pocket of, of the country. The, the Brolga, as Hamish has, has pointed out, has, we think, two distinct uh, populations, possibly more. We, we, we don't know. But they do interbreed with the Saurus crane, and the Saurus crane is widely dispersed in um, countries to the north of Australia. But the big problem is that they interbreed. So when we talk about brolgas, we, 
we kind of don't know enough about how many there really are, where they hang out, where they go, what they do. So Hamish, how did you go about the process of gathering information that planning bodies and government would take notice of when you became concerned about the survival of brogas in your neck of the woods when more wind farms were being planned and permissions were being sought? Long question, but let's, yeah. let, let's get um, right into that. Okay, well, to start with, the first thing that we had up against us was the consultant saying, it doesn't matter if we wipe them all out in Victoria, there's plenty more in the north of Australia. And they actually put that in writing. So um, being very fond of brogas and seeing them since I could uh, walk, basically, um, I did some research. I've got an engineering background and I've got a background in some computer modelling as well. And so the easiest thing to do was DNA test. So we reached out to a group of people um, who were interested in birds, um, naturalists, um, hunters and fishers, um, universities, zoos, and we said, pick up the feathers. Wherever you go, pick up the feathers. Tell us where you got them, give them to us, and we'll get them DNA tested. So the first roadblock block I ran into there was the Victorian government said, no, you won't. We're not going to allow you to DNA test them. We're going to basically prevent prevent you from doing it so that didn't stop me <laughs> we independently raised the money independently approached universities and we had one that agreed to do it for us and can i ask hamish when when the government said we won't let you do it what they were really saying was we won't let you use our facilities and we won't fund it that was what they were telling you wasn't it that was stronger than that they told one of the universities not to accept money from us um, so, so it was a bit stronger than that. <laughs> yeah. so, so, and then. So, uh, uh, I, I know we've got to be careful. Are you prepared to name um, the, the university that did do the testing for you, that would do the testing? Well, the, there's a report that's available on the internet, um, which is um, the DNA testing of of the Brolga and um, it was predominantly done through a contact at Deakin University in Warrnambool and um, it did have some help from um, Melbourne Uni and um, there was a group of German scientists in Australia at the time they assisted and one of the things that they determined was that the Saurus crane had interbred with the Brolgas then um, they were put under pressure to say that the the test might have been mixed up or to water it down. But then three years later, they came out with their own report that said they have interbred with the Brolgas and they started naming population dilution numbers. And it went, went from the first time they detected it. This is only from memory. Don't, don't nail them to the wall. But from memory, the first year they did the testing, they, they identified 60. And by year three or four, they identified 600. So it was a very rapid interbreeding which the Brogas in Victoria are genetically and physically isolated from the ones in Queensland and Northern Territory. So in terms of, you know, pure blood stock of Brolga, um, then we can be assured we have it here, whereas in the north it's slowly getting watered down. Yeah, and the, the, the concern is that... Um, uh, 98% of the Australian Brolga population is in uh, northern Queensland. Mm. Um, estimates between 100 and 200,000 birds. Yep. yep. But that the, um, the hybrid population is rapidly increasing and that the hybrid population is, um, is fertile. So, yes, they are. Uh, mm. So that it continues on. And uh, let's let's give him his his due. Where are we? Um, uh, Tim Nevitt from um, uh, James Cook University was doing a lot of that work. Now, yep. um, I'll jump off a, a little bit off topic, but the concerning thing for me with this Hamish is that 
we have. Um, it, it's a fair hypothesis that further um, genetic exploration, shall we say, testing more of the population um, in Victoria and then integrate up, you know, through the Riverina and up towards Queensland might actually tell us that we we might have two distinct species. We never, we're more likely to find that out than not. Maybe my my yeah, non scientist, my my non biologist, non zoologist um, brain tells me. So the, the the problem with the Victorian population, or you know, Victorian Riverina, South Australia, that is sort of slips into the other states. The problem with that southern Brolga population is when they did the DNA testing they found that it is two distinct genetically separated areas because the the victorian ones don't travel as far when they when they flock and go from the breeding season to the flocking season they don't travel as far as the ones at north because there's more water around there's more food around and they don't have to travel so they they found that the two genetically isolated species or families in southern australia um and they're getting smaller and some geneticists i've seen reports where they say if you get below 100 breeding pairs you may as well say the species is extinct and we're, we're down to 200 and that's split in two halves so we're getting pretty close to the wire so we we, we just had um malcolm zenbn let us down there a bit hamish so um, oh. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll just restate what I think you were saying there is that the situation is even more dire than was accepted by uh, by the department and the known literature in that um, the the population that you really know about in in Western Victoria, which also goes into South Australia and and may extend into New South Wales, is about two hundred breeding pairs. Breeding pairs. Breeding Act- pairs. active breeding pairs. Yeah. So and and that's split into two, genetically isolated in in Victoria as well. So, you, when, when you get down to a, a hundred breeding pairs, then it's hard to come back from extinction. And now most of we're the literature quite... that I, uh, sorry Hamish, uh, most of the literature that I could find and that you also provided uh, to me, is most of the surveys that are being relied on were conducted in about 2009, 2010. And then mm. with some further work that, uh, that, that you've been involved in and local groups have, have tried to do. But um, is there any current um, uh, literature out there? And when I say current, let's say within the last five years, that is widely accepted um, the the Swift site, which is um, uh, it's a it's a bird site. That they have the the Brolga counts that they've been doing um, in terms of every April. Theoretically, they go out and try and count the birds at the uh, flocking sites, but you have to read that information fairly closely too, because. One year they they added in a count from a South Australian site. The next year they took it out, things like that. But even that, if you... That's really where I was going, Hamish, is that there doesn't seem to be any work that has continually followed the same methodology no. and, and occurred at the same time so that you can compare one survey against another and that all the all the easily controlled variables are taken out and i I was i um (laughs) it's worse than that (laughs) one year they came up and they said we counted 930 brogas and i said well that's interesting but seeing it's been 640 660 for 10 years now all of a sudden we've jumped up to 900 so i asked to see the count sheets and i was refused so i did a freedom of information and i was refused so I went to the Ombudsman and the Office of Victorian Information Commissioner, and they eventually forced DELP to give me the count sheets. And it became very clear 
that they hadn't done the count at the same time on the same day at the different locations. They had done it over two days and I knew three flocks in my local area that I've been monitoring, they counted them twice because they counted them at one wetland and then in the afternoon or the next day, they counted them at another wetland, but I follow these birds around. So I knew it was the same birds. So all of a sudden, 900 became 600. What also confused me about looking through all of the literature and, and dear listener, I know it's very difficult for us to talk about stuff that I've read and that Hamish has read and that you haven't read, but the most of the surveys have been done by visual counts, but there yep. has been some work where GPS uh, locators have been put on birds and, <laughs> and there seems to be less um, weight put on the GPS work and uh, either a reluctance or an inability to fund further work, which, which uses that methodology, which to me seems to be able to give a much better picture of what brogers do and where they go. So yep. Hamish, you're obviously very, very interested and have a personal investment in the in the survival of these populations of brogers. Why do you think it is that the most reliable, and again, I'll, I'll put my neck on the chopping block, I'm going to assume that that method of surveying of an uh, of an endangered species in Victoria would be preferable to inconsistent methodology of surveys. It, have you got a view yeah. of why that? <laughs> why, yeah, I certainly why do. Why it hasn't <laughs> happened? Um, it's very inconvenient, the information that started coming out of the GPS, because in Australia, they they tagged a number of brogas in Victoria, and they tagged a number of cranes in America and Canada at the same time. The GPS transponders in America and Canada ran for six years, seven years, no problem. And they recorded all that data, and they came up with the fact that wind turbines displaced cranes for a minimum of five kilometres, they are affected by turbines up to 15 kilometres and below two kilometres, if the 5% of cranes that went into the wind farms, they actually lost weight because of a nervous energy from the noise or the vibration or the something. So in, in America and Canada, they did that. In Australia, after the first two years, when the, the Australian information also showed that the home ranges were a minimum of five kilometres, up to 15 kilometres. What did Australia do? We turned the transponders off. We refused to keep recording the data because what it shows was very inconvenient because that project was supposed to determine the home range size and it was supposed to then buffer those home ranges from wind turbines. That was the whole point of the project. But when that project started showing that you'd have to buffer a minimum of five kilometres, the wind industry wants to build them within 100 metres or 400 metres of the nest sites. So miraculously, not only did the transponders get switched off and they stopped recording it, but the project's actual brief was changed to instead of determining the home range, it was changed to how far do walking chicks go? So more than 97% of the data was not used. They used less than 7% of the data to come up with, oh, well, we better only buffer them 900 metres because that's how far a chick walks. Well, it's not the walking the chick that gets killed by the turbines and it's not yeah. the displacement for 5Ks. Hamish, they're obviously headbutting the base uh, of, uh, of the turbine and causing <laughs> themselves severe in, in injury. Now, let's, let's put the brogas aside for a minute and I do want to come back and talk about what what brogas do in their lives so that mm. people can understand it but let's let's talk about the wind farms yep. um, is, is there now 
one, two or three wind farms within the Victorian Brogas range that There's are 12. having... So there, there are 12 wind farms. In the Brogas habitat that are stopping them from nesting. Okay. But are they also uh, causing mortality of individuals as well? Well, it depends who you believe because the wind farm companies say, no, there aren't any, not a single one has been killed. Yet witnesses have witnessed two getting killed at Dalesford. Witnesses have witnessed three getting killed at MacArthur. AGL's own reports at MacArthur um, uh, show three have been killed, but it wasn't the wind farm that did it, of course. It was a fox or, or something else. So I asked for the um, reports, for aut autopsy reports, and again, I was denied them, but I did get some photographs. And the photographs of the two um, chicks that were that died, there's nothing wrong with them in terms of this, if a fox had got them, they would have been mauled, totally. um, but they weren't. They, they were abandoned by their parents because uh, I've done a study into this with the AEMO's data and um, a guy called uh, Dr. Woods' his reports from um, his uh, guy that did the reports for AGL. And it shows that every time the wind turbines were stopped in the first few years, for maintenance or whatever reason, the brogas would, would come back into the wind farm and they would try to nest. But as soon as the wind came up and the turbines went over 30% output, they would abandon the site, abandon the nest. And in one case, they had a large maintenance breakdown where the turbines were stopped for nearly a month. And the brogas actually hatched chicks, but then they started the turbines up and the parent brogas left the chicks to die. They just took off and left. So there's plenty of evidence to show there's lots of problems, but no one's owning up to it. <laughs> so, so he, he, here's here's where the here's where the problem is because I'm I'm assuming that you are a bit like me, Hamish, in general that you're you would be a proponent of wind farms instead of uh, setting up another Latrobe Valley of coal-fired power stations in 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 Western Victoria that there's a yeah, I don't care I don't care if they build the wind farms it's just they yeah, need to put them in the right place yeah so let so let's get that out there yeah. so that people aren't going to put tinfoil hats on us to start with there <laughs> but the but the problem I I have with with the whole process Hamish and why I'm really pleased that you you did get in touch with me because it's one of the things that we're going to have to confront more and more we're talking about brogas, but raptors are also oh, being yeah. knocked off by wind farms. And yep. what we what we need to do is find out more about what is actually happening and then learn and improve our practices in in building and managing locating wind farms because this infrastructure is going to increase in its prevalence in the environment i don't think there's any way around that so having been through the the process that you've been through hamish and i congratulate you for being one of those people that will put in an foi inquiry and that will yeah. appeal a decision and that will waste hours and hours on hold trying to get information from people who just do not want you to have it. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm making an assumption there, but I've been through the process myself. Yeah, and I know, that's right. That's uh, very uh, accurate. <laughs> uh, and it is, it is built in a way to guard information rather than share information, which is my biggest mm. peeve from it. Knowing what you know now, Hamish, what would you want to improve in the whole process? Well, the, the biggest thing that needs to happen is there has to be some honesty because the government knows, the consultant knows, the wind industry knows what's happening. And with the Raptors, there's been a couple of um, very, very damaging wind farms for raptors and one of them is agl macarthur 
And the consultants went in and got approval for that wind farm based on the fact that it would only kill two birds per turbine per year. And they're predominantly going to be magpies. And they will only kill two raptors over the entire wind farm in a year. Now, the first year it operated, it killed 10 birds per turbine per year. And this is their own estimates from what they picked up and counted and multiplied by the turbines, etc. And 30% were raptors. Now, the consultant who did the work said, well, what we're doing is wrong. He said, we're going and picking them up too infrequently. So the foxes are going to pick up more than we pick up. So we've got to increase the number we pick up. So they went more often and it wasn't 10, it was 13. And it was still 30% raptors. And what was happening was not only with the raptors, there were bats and other birds. So when, you, when you're looking at, there was 20, say 20 dead bats or birds per turbine per year, easily 20, you've got this huge food source. So the raptors come in to eat the food, then they get killed. And what they're finding down at MacArthur is it's a sink because raptors are coming in and getting killed for up to 10 kilometres away. And they're killing more than 400 raptors every year down there. And it can be prevented to some degree by using a radar type technology, which has been used in other places around the world. And when Dundonald Wind Farm was proposed, they told us in the community, we are going to put the radar technology on so that any time an eagle or a falcon or a brolga comes into the wind farm, we will turn it off. Well, guess what? It's been sold three times. The people that own it don't want to lose money, so they don't want to put a radar on because it'll be off more than it was on. <laughs> and there, there's other things that don't seem to have been done, which, uh, which other parts of the world are doing, which is even with the transmission lines, yeah, that are necessary, that there are ways to make them visible to birds. Yep. And brogas are big birds. They're cranes. They're, mm. uh, they're similar in mass to a pelican, but they're tall and stately. And they, they are known to crash into power lines. So in some parts of the world where they value their, their cranes, in fact, they might be iconic birds in some countries, mm. they actually have um, markers, indicators that are visible to the birds in a way that power lines are not, suspended wires are not, to help yep. avoid collisions. But I couldn't find even a study about um, that in Australia. Now, are you aware of anything that has been done about ameliorating the risk of transmission lines in Australia? Again, they, they were supposed to do it for, um, and this is only recently they're starting to say they will do it, the Dundonald Wind Farm, but you go and try and find them. I mean, <laughs> if I can't see them, the birds aren't going to be able to see them. Yeah, but, they, yeah. but what they did at Dundonald was even worse because the consultants, they're, they're not allowed to have a transmission line over a wetland. So the consultants just draw the wetland smaller. And yep. I've got a photograph of where the wetland is one kilometre bigger than where the consultants claim the edge is and the power line goes over the wetland. But now, because it's on a piece of paper, it gets ticked off by a government bureaucrat, it gets signed off, it gets built, no one cares. There's no protection. Now, consultant world is very small. Um, yes, there's about three or four doing everything. Yep. Yep. And, um, and my cursory look i've got to say i haven't exhaustively looked at all of the consultants operating in this space in uh in victoria because we're talking about a victorian population of, of birds yep. but um it seems to be that the same firms uh sort of both sides the argument <laughs> in that they have people who are not on their staff, on their websites, but are authoring reports for, for the companies 
So yeah. So if you do a quick look, you can't see that somebody who has, um, uh, who is listed as a staff member on on one of these companies, is actually authoring reports for a different company. Yeah. Well, I've gone after one of the one of the firms because. Uh, I had a meeting with Delp and I was expressing my concerns over a particular firm and their biodiversity manager quite openly said to me, yes, they are a gun for hire. They will write whatever the money says. So I went after that firm and um, on, on a basically a fraud type basis over one of the wind farms and all that they did in the end was change their name. So now there's someone else. So that bespurched name isn't recognised anymore. <laughs> But they do proudly say that they used to be the four. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, if there, you read so, there, so there's some, uh, there's obviously some kudos, but um, I, I, look, it's the problem of being a small country, I think, in that, uh, well, let's be honest about it, Hamish. Um, people who want to protect the Brolga are probably going to be members of things like land care groups and 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 whatnot in the local community and yep. and you can't afford to do the kind of studies that you need to go up against so you can't you can't get your own gun for hire because I, <laughs> I don't know you probably know uh, I'm I'm guessing that you wouldn't get change out of 150 grand for one of these. Um, well, I, I've got to know some of the. I've got to know some of the wind farm companies quite well over the years, as you can imagine. I've been battling against them <laughs> for um, probably sixteen years, and uh, I was in one hearing a while ago, and um, the chair of the hearing said something about the solicitors that are working for them. I said, "Oh yeah, yeah, we know each other well. I even know what, what his last car he bought and everything else." And, and they said, "What do you mean?" I said, "We've been sitting across the table for sixteen years." And I said, you know, it's it's just a game to them to some degree, but um, the the consultants concerned, they they go from one project to the other, and if you have a look at the other projects some of them have worked on, if there's something controversial like a channel deepening program that the government wants to do, and there's some endangered bird there, the same consultants in there saying it, don't don't worry, it's all right. If there's a you know Murray water system where they want to do some channel changes and it's going to be something affected, the same consultant saying, don't worry, it's going to be all right. And one of the wind farm companies that I have got to know quite well, they told me that they were told by the government, use consultant A and your project will be approved. Hmm. And it's, you know, it's it's all the part of the family. <laughs> now and look, look, I I, I can't resist. You've referred to the part the department by its acronym a couple of times. Can you just for non-Victorians tell us what the department we're talking about is called? Oh, gee, it's uh, environment, land, water, and planning. I think. Now, th now, that says everything you need to know about um, about why the system is problematic. Mm. Um, mining, farming, agriculture, forestry, water quality, planning are all dumped into the same department. Mm. Um, sometimes the interests of the different s stakeholders, and I hate the word, in each of those sec segments of our community are diametrically opposed and to have them all working under the one head in, in in a government setting is problematic to begin with because there are competitions within departments that get won there are power imbalances within yeah. departments that get won uh, so that some things never see the light of day as that you you found out with all your FOIs and and the appeals and whatnot that you've had to had to make just to get just to get information which is on the record and it's amazing how hard it is to find reports that are 
public property. People lose what? stuff all the time, don't they, in the department, Hamish? They're getting more careful too because um, I've run a couple of court cases and we've got another one running at the moment. And in the, one of the last court cases, we had a DELP person on the stand and they were asked about this meeting by the judge and the QCs, this meeting you've had that's approved this particular map but approved the buffer, blah, blah, blah. Where are the minutes? There weren't any. Where are the notes? There weren't any. So there's no documentation from this minute me meeting where it was approved. Who was it with? Oh, it was with the broker from the wind farm company. Who's the broker? Well, they used to work for Delp and they're some sort of relationship with the Delp person now. Yeah. Now, for these brokers, what they do now for, and it's not just wind farms, a lot of projects, they have a broker in the middle and the broker for 5% of the project value they manage all the, the people like me and the councils and everything else. And, you know, if there's any um, loosely saying uh, paying off Irri or to the pay irritants. the way. <laughs> they, they, they soothe the irritants. They do. And, and most times the irritants are soothed with a check or whatever else. Yeah. But they, yeah. they get 5%. So for one of the projects that we went and fought against, the broker got $25 million. For another one, the broker got $75 million. Yeah. So, and, and, and dear listener, th this is why I wanted to talk about this because the, the sums are eye watering and they're never mentioned <laughs> in any of the discussions that, that we have. So, so we're talking about a possibly genetically distinct, possibly a species in uh, distinct species comprising 200 breeding pairs, upper estimate of 800 birds. Okay, I think I think we're being very very generous with those with those numbers. Mm. Now, are they important? That's for the community to decide. But Hamish, as an individual, and a bunch of like-minded people who are in your let's say local land care group or whatever, so you're talking about people who are on small acreages making a living. The battler. The battler farmer, the small, the small family businesses who are out there having to risk their very existence to protect birds that are community property. Theoretically, no, who owns them? The community owns them. But for five percent of a project like that, you get kept in the dark. The and what what it, five, what it enables them to do, five percent, yep, yep, five percent of astronomical sums. But you mentioned mm. that there were QCs that you get to know. Now a QC doesn't turn up for for less than five grand a day. Yep. So so the process is flawed because the local volunteer group the local land care group that has to go out there and conduct its own surveys without its own scientists is fronting up against a project and a global organisation, because let's not bullshit each other. When you see Origin Energy or whatever energy company on the letterhead or on as the sponsor of a website like Swift, um, who we mentioned earlier on, that's not a mum and dad business from Warrnambool or Wandu or uh, Nilambic or where, wherever. These are global giant corporations and the amounts of money at, at stake are monumental. But to fight mm. them, Hamish, you have to put your own livelihood on the line. Is yeah, I, is there so, a what, better way? Is it is there a better way in our in our system to manage these kind of processes? There's a better way, but but the the general public don't either don't know, don't understand, or don't want to know. Like if you go and talk to people in Melbourne, they think wind farms are wonderful, and people that say they kill birds don't know what they're talking about. I've had people say to me, and it's a common one, more 
more um, birds are killed by cats than, than are by turbines. I said, well, next time you see a cat pull down a wedge-tail eagle or a brogue, let me know because we're talking different birds that are getting killed. We're talking iconic large birds, not the sparrows in your backyard. And, and the reason why the, the government and the companies use the broker is having the broker, there's nothing recorded on the government books so there's nothing you can get from FOI. There's nothing I mean, recorded on the company's books because it's A C. So yeah, it gives them a way thank out. Thank you for going there because the process <laughs> has now been bastardized mm. to protect vested interests from scrutiny. This is my yep. problem with the way it operates. And it doesn't matter which color of government you have. Um, so let's get that right out here too. No, um, and, and, and to some degree, and as much as a lot of people might think this is a bad thing to say, but the green, so-called green groups and green parties, to me, they're worse because at least the other parties, they, they tell you they're going to stick your hand in your pocket and, and do you over. The Greens say we're going to protect the world and the animals, but they still won't do anything to, to do that. And, the, and I mean, I, I feel terribly naive saying it, but the problem is the money. The problem oh, yeah, is all money. the money. Yeah, and, it's all money. And... What what you just said about the people complaining about cats is mm. also part of the problem is that we've been conditioned to not be able to deal with a couple of things at once. And and the fact that my neighbour's cat goes out and kills birds at night because they're irresponsible and they won't keep it in should not mm. preclude me from giving a shit about brogas. <laughs> That's right. I mean, right? <laughs> It's and and the fact the fact that you haven't been able to get too much traction about this um, is concerning. But I also think it's because of the kind of people, and I've got to be careful how I phrase this because I don't want to. I'm not. I'm talking about who the constituents are that are affected mm. by the, uh, the, the or, or that come in contact with these populations of brogas. Um, there ain't no marginal seats here. Uh, let's, no. uh, let's put it that way. No. I, I don't think that protecting the brolga is going to see Wannan swing to the Greens or to the ALP. And that's part no. of the problem because there is no political heft that that you have other than and you know let's I'll, I'll put it out there um the network the, the informal network in in your part of victoria is probably not the pinko uh network that i have hamish no and but, that, but i've got but, i've got friends who are in the I, so-called pinko network yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, no, no, and, 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 and I'm not making it a personal thing about you, Hamish. And, and, and no, I know, what you, I know exactly what you mean. And, and, but... and I, I very clumsily put these things out there often and can get a kicking for it. No, that's okay. But, that's okay because but, I, I've got friends in Melbourne that, um, that are in the Greens and one of them took one of my documents that I'd put together about what's happening with the Brogas and everything else and they took it to a Greens meeting in the city. And they got up and said, here's a report done by a concerned citizen over the fact that wind farms are killing birds and displacing birds. All they need is a 5K buffer and this species will probably survive. And the person took the report in front of the room full of people, threw it in the bin and said, he's probably paid by the coal industry. Didn't even read it, didn't look at it, just made an assumption. And and this person who's been going to those meetings and as a member and everything else for 10 years said, well, it's the last time I'm going because you're not even listening. Yeah, and and and, th and this is the problem that exists in uh, when, when, when the whole process is kind of secret. Now, um, let... let Let's see if we can provoke a cat or two. Who's your federal member for for your seat, Hamish? 
Dan Tian and I um, okay. have been. Dan, now, Dan Tian is a minister in a, a cabinet minister, so it's not like he doesn't have any clout. What about yeah. in the Victorian Parliament? Who Victorian who Parliament? Um, we've got Richard Reardon, who's been quite supportive in terms of he's he's like, for instance, he lobbied to get the power line underground at Mortlake and things like that. So he's been okay. successful and, in that. And Richard Reardon is uh, representing which party? He's a Liberal, yep. Okay. And is yep. he the lower house rep? Oh, gee, now, you, now you're getting me on the politics. <laughs> well, 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 you've got lower house and upper house representatives. So what, yeah, what I think he's lower house. We, we have another one. You, which have is at a... least, you have at least three representatives. Yeah, we have in, a member in, for in... Western Victoria who's Andy Medic, okay. um, and who's which independent. Colour... Which colour suit does he wear? Or um, he's supposed to be independent, but he tends to vote more with the government than anyone else in Victoria. Okay, so he so so he can uh, he wears pink pajamas. Are we going to say? <laughs> yeah, I guess. So. Okay, so um, now which what I want to get what I want to just want to tease out is have any of these representative politicians been um been representing your view are they are any of them fighting for the broga yeah richard reardon has been and and he's done things in parliament um dan Tian hasn't uh, and in fact i've been commenting on dan Tian's twitter page of late because he's allowed something very strange to happen with um the wind industry where the government's future fund has bought out one of the uh, larger outfits and then within six months, somehow, miraculously, after paying $2.8 billion for an asset that's worth $800 million, that particular company is now back in control of it. And it's off the share market. And that just boggles my mind. And I, I regularly write to Dan Teen on his Twitter page and say, you oversaw this. How can you allow that? Well, we, we both know the answer to that, Hamish, but we <laughs> cannot say it because uh, because we cannot defend it. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm I'm very very exasperated, and I think we have pointed out the problems. Let's talk about any positives that we that we can draw out of what's going on with Brogas in in your neck of the woods, Hamish. What who who, who are apart from yourself? Who are the voices of the Broga, and are there are there sufficient safe sites? Are, are landowners doing doing the work that the government should be doing in protecting the species? There are a number of um, safe sites, as you call them, and concerned individuals. But um, at the moment around uh, Mortlake and Willatook and places like that where there are still large Brogue populations, there's also proposed wind farms. And both the Mount Fines project, which is near Mortlake, and the Willatook project, which is fairly close to MacArthur, um, the landholders are protecting their birds, are voicing their opinions, and they're getting comments back from the companies like, oh, you're only new to the area, you wouldn't know. Well, they've been there 15 years, and that's new enough for them. And, and the, the girl's husband's been there for about 30, 40 years. And they're refusing to put on their project uh, protected areas nest sites that people go out and photograph and give them and record with the DELP database and the big companies are just ignoring them. So, yes, these are, there's some safe sites left, but there's turbines proposed to be right in the middle of them and they're fighting for that at the moment. That's why we're saying 5K buffer, just give us the 5K buffer, put them where you like, but give us the 5K buffer. Have you got a rail trail down there, Hamish? Oh, not close by to us. There's oh, probably but, the closest but, rail but, trails. Yeah. But you, you but you know about the, the concept. I'm just thinking maybe maybe there needs to be a Brolga trail. Um an well, informal an informal one. Twelve uh, years and, ago and, I put I put that to the government. I drew a map and and um and said if you keep the turbines out of there, you're gonna protect ninety percent of the birds. It got taken to government by 
Um, three times it got taken to government by people from within the planning department of Dell, and three times the minister said no way. Now, let, 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 let's take it out of the hands of government because they're always going to, doesn't matter, like we've said, it doesn't matter which, which colour government you've got, yeah. they're going to be leaned on. Um, let, let's, let's get an informal Brolga trail and let, let, let's three times a year take people to see Brolgas. Mm. Let's, let, let's, let's do it so that it's visible and that more people see Brolgas. I'm a bird nut, Hamish. I've never <laughs> seen a Brolga in Victoria. Really? I've, I've never seen a Brolga in Victoria, and I know those Western districts quite well. And I've yeah. been down there many times, but I have never seen Brolgas. Um, uh, I, I see uh, them every day on my farm. <laughs> yeah, well, and people should be coming. The, the, the reason I said the rail trail and brought it up is that people will be aware that a lot of regional areas in Australia have said, come and ride your bike or put on your backpack and walk along the disused rail trails mm. and see a lot of the stuff that you can't see in our region when you're on the bitumen, when you're driving around. Yep. Well, let, why don't we do something informal like this? Why don't we do three weekends a year, breeding and non-breeding, Get a bunch of people with bikes or wh however, and come and yep. see some brogas and publicise the bejesus out of it, and then yeah. nobody can say they're not there. Yeah, that, um, it's worth a thought. Well, I am your <laughs> vessel, Hamish. I, I am your <laughs> vessel for this. Um, because yeah. uh, this is what drives me bonkers, is that. The brogas that are there are a bloody tourism asset. Mm. Right? Um, bird nerds travel to see birds. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's why I started the Twitter page up again um, and just putting photographs of, of the birds that are basically on our farm and I've retweeted other people's as well. But but um, w when you're protecting the brolga or a brolga wetland, you're also on, on our farm, the 60, over 60 other species that use the same wetland. And there's migratory birds and other birds that, that come and go. But if you protect that one wetland, you're protecting 60 species, not just not just the brolga. Now we we've got some people who are who are with us live. I, I'd be interested to know if those people and stick it in stick a comment or something in there for us. Um, have you seen a brolga in the wild? And would you like if you knew where to go? If you could rock up to Hamish's place and have a barbecue and talk to Hamish about brogas, would you think that would be a good way to spend a weekend checking out the 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 unknown places of Western Victoria and seeing some broga chicks? Hopefully they're not uh, they're not running headfirst into uh, turbine <laughs> bases and doing themselves terrible injury. Here mm. we go, for sure. There we go, <laughs> Hamish. So uh, uh, I, I can tell you that a, a very, very substantial proportion of of our uh, of our viewing audience have said yes. So yep. <laughs> that's as scientifically valid as half of the surveys that are being done. Yeah. Oh, I, look, don't let that idea ha die, Hamish. Don't let that idea die because um, the Brolga is an iconic species. We've only got two cranes, unless genetic testing tells us otherwise, uh, that we might uh, we might have our own special Victorian brolga. Who knows? Well, um, the, the thing is, they're so old too. The species is um, they, they've done uh, dig up what do you call it when the guys dig up the dirt and measure the age of bones and things. They like archaeology. That's the ones. <laughs> They, they did a dig in Nebraska and they found the cranes were 10 million years old. Mm. Now, the Australian crane is believed to be older again because the Australian crane is the only one in the world that's got a tear duct that can help them take, they can drink salt water. It's the only one in the world that can drink salt water. And it's thought that it is older than 10 million years old. 
And what really grots me is they're going to build wind farms that have got a life for less than 20 years and exterminate a species that's managed to survive for 10 million years so far. And they, it, it, there's another thing that I'm sure would shock people. A wind farm has an economic life of less than 20 years. Oh, it's much that, less. MacArthur has been that, running nine and it's half, half of those turbines are down at the moment. And they've got about 30 or 40 gearboxes out. They've got to change the blades on a lot. So you're looking at, it's more like 15 years before they should be pulled down. Yeah. So there, there are huge, huge issues. Now, I, I might be asking you to dob in your friends and neighbours here, Hamish, and I'm going to do uh, do something I always uh, I always want to do, which is ask completely inappropriate questions. But what let let's look at the economics of being a landowner in mm-hmm. in your area. Um, what what are you running? You're running sheep. I'm going to guess is your main. Uh, no, activity. we've got a few sheep, but we mainly run cattle and do cropping. Okay, so uh, okay, so you're you're doing cattle and cropping, and we're um, we're organic because I don't want chemicals or fertilisers in the Brogas wetland. So we're we're yeah. um, USDA NOP organic certified. Okay, so you're you're already taking the sort of action that we wish everyone would would be taking <laughs> around the world, um, but it it'll come. But what? What can you and your neighbours expect to earn? Let's look at maybe a five-year average per hectare from farming activity. Oh, uh, like it, every year is different. Like I, I always work on the theory that you make money, you make good money one year in five, you break yeah, even but, two years in five, Hamish, and you lose money one year in five. Yeah, yeah, but you've got to have averages. If we kicked it out to 10-year average, would, would you have a... Uh, where, where I'm going with this, I don't. I, I'm not trying to get to to get the tax department to be over looking over your shoulder at your accounts. What yep. I'm getting at is that you can make an awful lot of money by being a proponent of wind farms on your property. And oh often, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you'd it's make better better yep. per hectare to be a wind farmer than to be a farmer. Is that yeah? Still, and that's that's what that that's the what they they get people and they and they target quite often they target. Um, older generations of farmers as well, and um, which is a bit mean because they, they, I guess, are more trusting and, and believing when they say this won't cause you a problem or that won't happen or you get money for here. And I know one guy, and he was promised, he was promised sixty turbines on his property, and he was promised twenty thousand dollars a turbine per year, and that's more money than he would see in twenty years of farming. Oh, so I'd he took it say on. fifty years of farming. Whoa. Yeah, well, anyway, so he took that on. But anyway, what happened was, by the time it got through planning and everything else, and they they you know eventually built them, he didn't get that many. He got eight. So he thought, oh well, eight times twenty thousand. But the company said, hang on a minute, read the fine print. That's dependent on the price of the REC. That's depending on us being profitable. That's dependent on this. It's dependent on that. So he ended up getting $4,000 a year for, for much, much less turbines. And he says, worst thing he'd ever done because it split his farm up. It's, you know, done everything and that doesn't achieve it. He can't live in his own house because of the noise. He has to move off his property and all these other negatives because what was promised and what he signed up for, and he, it's his own fault because he didn't read the fine print, but what he signed up for was very different in his mind to what he got. Mm. But there are some there's, there's, well, there are some landholders that are that are getting you know what they were told and getting paid well, depending on the company. But as the as the turbines get older, and you've got like down Codrington now, where they're in their twenty second year or something, and and literally you drive past and they're rusting and there's oil pouring out of them, and you look up their generation, they're very poor generating. Well. One of the farmers down there was saying that this year they're not even getting their payment that they were promised because and, they're not economical anymore. Hamish, where, where these wind farms are reaching maturity, the, mm. the end of their economic life and their structural life, really, are, are they going to be replaced by new turbines or... Uh, or do the companies look for a fresh victim? 
at the moment we don't know because the Codrington is going to be the first one to to go down the chute, so to speak. But around the world, what has happened is they they don't repower that site because the towers are too small for the new turbines. They won't take the weight. The wiring's too small to take the power out. So you have to basically start from fresh anyway. And if you're going to start a fresh site, then you want a better site than the one that you got approval for 20 years ago, which is now causing you heaps of trouble. So is this going to be like what's happened with the mining industry where, where in the next 20, 25, 30 years, we're going to see all around the country and all around the world, these dinosaur turbines, which are not being used, um, that then become the landowner's responsibility to tear down and remove? Or, well, in, in America or at the are moment... the companies on the hook? No, the company's not on the hook. In, in America at the moment, there's over 6,000 turbines that aren't operating and that are rusting away. Uh, in Australia, if you read the fine print on the contracts, there's supposed to be a fund created in the last two years of the 25-year life to dismantle the turbines and remove them off site. But in the contracts after that, it says, but if for any reason the company is insolvent or moved on or has left the site, so, it's the landholder's responsibility. So, it's a con. so, so the it's a con. landowner is on the hook. The landowner, yeah, so, it, so it is just like mining and that in the end you'll have, uh, let, let's look at the Western districts, uh, Dan Tian will have, uh, let's say there's 50 or 70 landowners um, and it won't be Dan Tan, it'll be his grandchildren or something. Because, because <laughs> In the dynasty the of politics. It works. That's, well, that's the way it works down there, buddy. I know, um, I know. It, um, so actually it'll probably be Malcolm Fraser's bloody great-grandchildren or something down there. <laughs> Dan's just keeping it, uh, keeping the seat warm. Um, but he'll have a whole lot of unhappy constituents saying we've got these dead bloody dinosaur uh wind turbines clogging up our farm and our beautiful view um please can you make the taxpayers of australia tear them down and and re-beautify our farm and that's that's yeah. what's going to happen and it's going to be just like mining the yeah. mining and, company and will, will 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 go broke we can't afford to do the uh, amelioriz amelioration and restoration of the site like like yep. our contract says, but unfortunately we're broke. So guess what? Taxpayer of Australia, welcome to the mining boom. Well, the contracts are supposed to put that on the landholder, but um, Richard Reardon did a piece in the Weekly Times a couple of months back now, and he did the maths for what it costs to take them down if the companies walk away and what the landholder gets for the rent for the 25 years, and the 25 years rent did not come close no, no, to no, the pulling but, down. But again, that's my point with, and why we should be having the, the discussion. We're yeah. in an election cycle here. These are things that need to be discussed. The landowners on the hook, but the 70, 80, 100 landowners, whoever, however many it is, are not going to be the ones who want to pay. They're going to go to federal representative or state representative and say this isn't fair the company's never never put the fund together and the money isn't there it's not fair that we do it so please can we have the community do it for us and that's mm. that and that's why the that's why the game is rigged it's yeah it, it's rigged it's always rigged it's it's oh it makes me angry and what we really should be doing is just getting together and going, we need wind, we need solar, we need batteries. How can we do them in the best way and in a way that we can future-proof uh, against the potential damage in the years to come so that we can still have brogas and we can still turn our lights on? I yeah. Mean, it It's... Uh, do we? Well, do you think we know well, enough to do the two? I mean, do, no, do, no, it's too much money and too much greed. But if you have a look on my Twitter page of a few days ago, I did a, a AEMO 
fuels burnt for energy used print out straight off the AEMO site. And over the Easter weekend, we were running 90% on coal still. And we've spent yeah. $7 billion on wind farms in Victoria. We've spent billions of dollars on batteries and power lines and everything else. And in nine years, we're still running 90% coal. And guess what the rest of it was? Hydro. So we weren't, you know, the, the, what they're doing doesn't work. But that's a whole different argument. My argument is don't eliminate a species in the yeah, process. Yeah, Do what yeah. you like. Build what you like. I don't care. Yeah, but just yeah. give us 5K buffer. Um, gee, power. Power is such a a fraught problem because because when we when we privatized it and we divvied up um divvied up the market into a whole bunch mm. of corporate entities that own stuff theoretically own stuff it meant that we took away we took away from the community the opportunity to do what individuals in the community might like to do mm. so that uh, so that you and I cannot make individual decisions about how we produce and consume power. And I think that was probably one of the stupidest things that that we've done as a community in, in the community that you and I live in. And it's been repeated around the world and yeah. and certainly in Australia in that, you can't make a decision about how you will um, connect to the power grid without the the interests of a global corporation being the paramount interest in that in that decision. Unless you go off grid you, completely. Well, that that's it. You have to completely disconnect from yeah. from the community asset that your family, my family that their ancestors invested in and built up. Yeah. Um, one, but it's the same. Just, you, you could take that to the manufacturing, to refining oil, to oh, everything. everything. Like everything, e everything that was built after the Second World War is now being pulled apart, and and yeah. they're not replacing it with anything. Yeah. It's um. It's really sad. So brogers, yep. brogers, brogers. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm I'm coming back to birds. When's the best time for someone to come down to the Western Districts to see your brogers, Hamish? Uh, well, it depends if they want to help plough the paddock and do the fences and everything while they're here. Otherwise, my day is going to be shot. <laughs> um, no, but, but they... Nest, nesting time is generally... It can be any time of the year depending on rain. We've had them nest in January. We've had them nest in, in December. But generally, they nest between... Um, probably June and the end of November to start of December. And they will start to flock depending on, again, availability of food and size of, of flocks and things like that. I've had them start as early as September. and um, But normally it's about January. but um, And they flock through till about this time of year now. And you, you mentioned that they're monogamous. So... Do they do they mate for life as far as you yeah know? they 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 think they mate for life and from what I've seen with the ones on our farm and because we've also got two flocking sites on our farm as well so we we see birds and and you recognise some of the birds everyone says they're different but but you can recognise different birds that come and go and we've got this one poor old chap he's been coming for five years on his own and leaving on his own because he lost he his mate he can't get a date poor no, can't get a date uh, so, but but there's they live for. I don't know, 35, 40 years old. So there's a, just because there's, you know, 600 birds, it doesn't mean there's 300 nesting pairs. No. That's why, because there's monogamous ones that have not got a mate, there's ones that are just too old to breed yeah. and there's and young some ones. That are so. probably too young. Yep. Still learning, yeah. still learning how to get a date. That's right. So that's why, you know, a conservative estimate of 200 breeding pairs left is, I don't think it's too far off. Um, now, someone known known to you, Hamish, has just uh, popped in a comment. Um, yep. I'll thank you, Ian, Ian Penner, for um, actually putting me in touch with, with Hamish. Green Swamp, which is managed by the uh, Nature Glenelg Trust, 
is a good yep. place to see brogas. At the moment, there's a flock of about 200 there, apparently, yeah. So if I'm heading down to Western Victoria, um, where would I find Green Swamp? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's on private land, so I'm not sure you're going to find it without contacting the landholder and going in, but um, it's um, not far from the Grampians. Um, okay. Is, all right. Let, let, let's... Let's extend that point because I've been encouraging people to go and see brogas. Yeah. Are, are there are there public um, uh, public lakes, public um, flooding yeah. sites there's, where people one, can reliably see them? Yeah, there's one near Geelong, um, and um, you, you can just drive in there on the public road. Um, I think it's Connie Warren, um, oh, yeah. just near Con, Geelong. Con, Connie Warren. Yeah, you, you can see them there. Um, you can see them on the um, sewage treatment plant. There's a couple in there. Um, uh, it's another place, um, Bull Lagoon, which is it's oh, public. Oh, yeah, yeah, Bull, yeah, Bull Lagoon. But yeah. that's, again, it's a bit potluck. They're pretty big areas and you've got to know what you're looking for and everything else. Um, but in terms of, like, just farmland like us, we've got two you can see from the road. Um, um, most of it's most of them are on private land. They're very private bird. Like the ones that even on our place that you can see from the road, if a car pulls up, immediately they got their heads up, they're looking around, and they'll start to walk away. And even though their nest is three hundred meters in, you'd need to look with binoculars. But as soon as a car pulls up on the road, they start moving away. And um, so yeah, you'd, you'd need to you'd need to be with someone that knew how to look at them without disturbing them and what vantage point. Otherwise, you're going to do more damage than than good. You might see a brolga, but you might disturb their nest. Yeah, so let, let, let's reiterate that point, that when the birds are breeding, you don't want to be crisscrossing the western districts in your <laughs> looking for brolgas because, uh, well... It, People don't often think about that, Hamish. We don't know yeah. enough about the birds to, um, it, it, in the general consciousness, it's not like the Japanese and their cranes and they're having festivals and, you know, storks mm. in, in in Europe and whatnot. Brogas are just invisible to us these days. Um, yeah. they're, they're almost a myth, you know, the dancing brolga and all that. But who's seen them? You know, yeah. I'm a bird nerd. I haven't seen them. Um now, bird watchers are, are weird sometimes, Hamish. Let's be honest, and and I don't want us to be encouraging if it's going to do damage. Yeah, which you I have, may you have, have be, recklessly done earlier in the uh, conversation. Yeah, you have to be. To, you have to be fairly to be careful. You don't disturb them. For them. Yeah, don't yeah, you disturb have to be, them. So, don't disturb them. Uh, which the is funny councils, because. Sorry, Hamish. I was going to say that they, it's funny, like, because I'm there every day and my ute, they know my ute and I so can they... get within, I can get within 20 metres of them because I'm there every day. And if I'm ploughing a paddock, they'll, fly, they'll come in and, and, and walk in behind the tractor. And when I'm doing the hay, they walk in front of the mower, hoping, hoping I, you know, get a mouse to come out or something like that. And, um, you know, so they, they choose when they want to be, around you um but if you violate their their nesting site or where they are sleeping then then they can move off yeah well that 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 was one of the next things i wanted to ask you about it is that their their habits have, have they got a distinct roosting place compared to where they go and congregate to feed um like yeah. They know you well. You know them well. What What does yeah. a brolga do on on your place during the, during the day? Well, depending on the season, um, they like it six to eight inches of water. So they will have three favourite wetlands where they will will nest or sleep. So this time of year, um, it's been quite dry. They'll go to you know site A because site B is already dry. Now, if we get a wet winter, site A and B are too deep, so they'll nest in site C. So they have that, that um, I guess, ability to, to move around between spots. But 
I've I've had a pair of brogues and I don't know how they do it. And I've had swans do the same thing where there's a rain event coming and they'll start building a nest and, and they, they know they move it. Yeah. They, they'll move it onto dry ground and, yeah. and the next day it's got water around it. You think, yeah. and where they were building it originally, it's underwater. You go, how do they know? <laughs> well, they, uh, they know that. Well, it's one of the great mysteries, isn't it? How do, how do birds from all over Australia know to head to somewhere that's about to flood so yeah. that they're there yeah. when the flood arrives to start breeding? I mean, yeah. we just don't well, we just don't know. Well, we get uh, migratory birds here from um, uh, Siberia, from China, from Alaska, from Japan, and so you, they you, come you, to our wetlands. You're getting snipe? I'm, I'm guessing yeah, yeah. you're getting snipe. What else are you yeah. getting? Uh, oh, there's getting... all sorts of things. Sandpipers and... Sandpipers, um, dotterels. Yeah, and we even get the the ones from New Zealand that come across here in the winter and, and different things. There's um, uh, little plovers, banded. I think they're a banded plover. Banded, but banded, um, banded plover, double banded plover. Yeah, <laughs> but but what we found because we've sort of set up here to be, we're here for the brogers and we farm to pay for the brogers and to buy more land to put under water for more brogers. But do you, um, do you hear that? Do you hear that, people? <laughs> Hamish does more for the brogers than anybody in our government does, and he does it off his own back. You know, this guy. Fair but what 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 we found You're is the brogers, <laughs> the brogers know that we've got a good food source. So if you listen to the consultants, they'll say a broger has a territory of twelve hundred acres, and they won't they do this, they won't do that, they won't go into the other area. It's a lot of rubbish. We've got two brogers nesting in the same swamp and one of our neighbours has got two nesting in the same one as well because there's not much around to nest, so they nest where they can. And we have, one day I've got a photo of eight brogers that came in from other surrounding nesting areas to feed on our place during the nesting season. And I've got a photo of them all together in the same spot feeding. And the consultants will say this doesn't happen, but I've got photos of it happening. And halfway through the day, they all flew out. They swapped over their nest's partner and their partner flew in. And I tracked some of them. I drove and followed them as, as they flew. And some of them came from seven and eight kilometres away just to feed on our place and turn around, go back, swap over on the nest and the partner come and feed because we had the food supply. Well, you know what that that tells me, Hamish? You're, you're organic. you got the best frogs, mate. <laughs> but then they want to build a wind farm right next to us um, to have turbines within three or four hundred meters from a nesting site, claiming they don't nest there. And you know, then we're in another argument and you know, fighting for the next five years. Okay, now I'm, the bird emergency is all about information, spreading information, gathering information, sharing information. If you've got some information about brogers, contact me. I I want to get on the broger hobby horse. And hey, if you think Hamish is wrong, um, and you you're a broger expert, you know, look me up, Grant at thebirdemergency dot com, and um, let let's go down the broger rabbit hole because I, I'm. I, I, I was surprised when when Ian and, and, and Hamish hunted me down. Um, I didn't know there were that many brogers still in Victoria. I thought the brogers story in Victoria was basically after a big rain event or some flooding, we'll get eruptions of brogers. Now, I'm a bird nerd. How can anybody who is not already invested have any clue about this hamish other local councils promoting brogas a brogas no. part of the western victorian story our our council unfortunately is the other way um there's been three overseas trips to councillors and offices paid for by the wind farm companies there's uh, two council employees get this employed to uh um, look at permit compliance, and guess who's paying their wages? The wind farm companies. Yeah, now, <laughs> so and, there's and, no compliance. And, um, okay, let, let's call them out. Uh, 
the, the councils are? Which councils? Our, our council here is the Moyne Shire, and I'm constantly at battle with them about permit compliance and brogas because they just will not force the wind farm companies to adhere to the permits that are even written, let alone do any other protection. Now, I mean, the, the, uh, I'm sure the general public aren't aware of this either, that the people who are charged with um, making sure that permit conditions, be it for any kind of development, but the people who are charged with monitoring and and enforcing the regulations are being paid to go on overseas trips by the very companies that they have to monitor and potentially write a ticket against. Or, well, you know, one, one, one particular project, the councils are responsible for, for writing out the permits to remove native vegetation. And this particular project had a permit to remove five hectares. In the first two weeks, they removed 20. So I got onto the council and said, hang on a minute, they have a permit for five. Come and look, come and stop this. And they refused to. In the end, they cleared 60 hectares of native vegetation, some on, on Crown land, some on Vic Roads land, some on council land and some on private property. And to this very day, the council refuses to go and look at the damage and make the company pay for mitigation or compensation. And... In the permit that the council wrote, they wrote that they will not go and follow up and look at it. They'll rely on the wind farm company telling them what they've yeah, done. Yeah. Now, can you imagine a building permit for your house or doing your sewer and that? It's well, just ag- ludicrous. Well, well, actually, yes, I can because that's all been privatised too. Uh, <laughs> but, but, dear listener, you will be shocked to know that the company that that we have we have not named but the company that was involved in a lot of this research and that Hamish has um, a very special place in his heart for, you'd be <laughs> shocked to know that um, that their services are include native vegetation assessments, threatened flora assessments, um, fauna assessments, offset planning and approvals. Right? The system and you have to... Broken. You have to... You have to read their reports. You have to read the reports carefully too because most people read the summary and the conclusion and nothing in between. And one document was 3,000 pages and they got got paid a lot of money. Like they they got paid two or $300,000 to do this particular report. And one adjustment, the company who they did it for told me overnight they had to do an adjustment and they charged them $20,000 for the adjustment. But in the in the summary of the report, which is probably, says, which is probably two sentences or something. <laughs> in the summary of the report, it says they're going to pick up and remove and relocate it, legless lizards and dunnets and things like that from in front of the bulldozers to ensure that they're relocated somewhere else. When you read the body of the report, it says the government no longer um, allows the relocation of species because it doesn't work. Therefore, we're not going to do it. But if you read the summary of the conclusion, you would think, oh, that's wonderful, it's all right. But when you read the body, it's not going to happen. Uh, look, Hamish, it's depressing, isn't it? Because, um, <laughs> uh, and, and and often you can only get publicly available for free an abstract and a conclusion, and you can't actually get the body of the report without without yep. forking out a thousand bucks or something, which, you know, well, they, they wanted seven thousand dollars for one of the yeah, well, they're, they're, um, things that I asked and, for, and, and, and the ombudsman said no. Doing that. Yeah. No, and the ombudsman said no. You're giving it to him for nothing, which was good. Yeah, yeah. Well, thankfully we've we've got an ombudsman. Um, we we haven't done a lot of birds today, Hamish, but the, <laughs> but but the, this is part of the problem. we we're, we're always talking about offsets and. You know, there's just so much guff talk where people hide behind the processes. Why I was really keen to to talk to you, and thanks, Ian, for um for for hitting me up on uh, on Twitter, which is the best place to find me at Bird Emergency. Um, you'll always find me having a rant on Twitter. Uh, the the process is broken. The public information process is 
is skewed. It's not only flawed, it's biased in in char- in in favour of the people who have a vested outcome um, always always in mind. Where we can get information, and I'm not having I'm not having a shot at Swift, um, because they they're doing the best they can. But hey, Origin Energy is a sponsor of theirs. It's so what whatever they do, and I'm not saying that they've been nefarious or anything. Like that, I'm not saying that at all. But they they have to bear in mind what. What a sponsor will will like and won't like, because they need to get the money to have their website and to pay their phone bills and mm. you know, the system's broken. All the stuff that the government should be doing has been outsourced to people who who don't have the community interest at at, at front of mind. I'm not saying they're all bad or whatever, but the system is now broken. And we need to take it back. And Hamish, you should not have it, have to fund it on behalf of the community. That's my big problem. Thank you, and thank yeah. you, Ian, and all of the volunteers. Hey, let's give let's give the Landcare groups and whatnot in the area a shout out. Who um, who's doing all the uh, all the sort of restoration and reveg work and whatnot in your area, Hamish? Well. Yeah, I mean, there's it's not a lot happening unless it's done on private landholders with private landholder money. So yep. you know, the companies who, are supposed to do it. it. Don't. So who uh, who's doing it? I want to I, I want to recognise those people who are out there, um, uh, you know, putting their own uh, their own money and their own time into preserving the birds since our state and federal governments are, are, are not doing it adequately. Yeah, it, it comes down to private landholders and people that are prepared to, to put some money in. Some of the CMAs will, will help with, um, you know, part funding things. Um, the Nature Glenel Trust will help sometimes to fund things, but it's predominantly, um, you know, the landholders themselves. And you know, you're saying, with you know, spending our own money, yeah, we, we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on legal fees alone. And um, I started a GoFundMe page oh, more than a year ago now, and um, I think we've only raised the eleven thousand. I, I set a target of six hundred thousand because that's what a court case can cost to go through to the end. If you speak, particularly if you appeal or, or lose and have to pay pay uh, other people's costs, and um, one of the local groups um, put the hat around and, and they they raised you know, thirty or forty thousand um, dollars. The GoFundMe paid page raised 11 but still personally um yeah we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars and so, and we shouldn't have to because we've got de- that, government departments that are supposed to be doing what we're doing <laughs> that that's the point uh, uh hamish um <laughs> that's the point we probably could have done this in 10 minutes <laughs> uh, the the point is people that no matter where you live Probably the system is now rigged against someone like Hamish. He's got birds who hang out on his farm who need protection and he's had to spend, I mean, let's not beat around the bush, an absolute shitload of money. More money than most people will be able to save in their entire lives to protect the brolga because our governments don't do it. So please do something. If you can't, you can't do everything, but please do something. Hamish, where would you like people to direct their attention if they want to assist you? What's the GoFundMe page? Uh, if you just go on to GoFundMe and, and look up, just put the word Brolga in, it'll, Brolga. it'll come up. Yeah, <laughs> GoFundMe and Brolga, it'll come up. <laughs> Uh, and that that's to try and get the consultants accountable. That's a, a court case we want to run in the future. Um, but the, that's the financial side. But the the other side that people can do is is get stuck into Lily D'Ambrosio and and the Secretary of Delp, John Bradley, and and say you know demand a five k buffer. I mean it's it's not hard. 
it just means you don't, you don't put as many turbines in that spot. You move them somewhere else. So, you know, it's not a hard thing to ask. Uh, sometimes I feel sorry for, for the minister. Lily D'Ambrosia is the minister responsible for conservation and forestry and wind farms and all the other stuff that uh, seem like they shouldn't be in the same portfolio. Um, she can't protect the greater glider. She can't protect the lead beater's possum. She can't protect... She just can't do it because we're captured. Uh, as a community and whatnot, we're captured by these industries. Um, but but she, she's trying to put in a new standard at the moment, a new standard to supposedly protect brogers, and we've held it up for over a year now because it's just full of rubbish. And in, in the standard, she's claiming that brogers don't use saline wetlands. Now, their own reports for this area show brogers nesting, feeding, breeding and flocking in saline wetlands, but they're trying to say they don't so that the wind farms can build in those areas. And the brogers the only crane in the world that can drink salt water. And, and they just make all these ludicrous claims, claims in this standard that they want to introduce. And it's nothing to do with protecting the brogger. It's to eliminate brogger out of the picture so the wind farms can build what they're like. So, you know, she, she's in a position where she can do something positive and she's doing the reverse. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, look, it's just frustrating, Hamish. I, I, I hope people will, will exert some pressure. Is there... Uh, it's not still open for comment or anything, though, is it? No. The, um, no. And they're refusing to publish. They're refusing to publish people's comments, and they were supposed to be published um, uh, fifteen months ago. They were supposed to go on public yeah. comment, a uh, public display, and they're refusing to even and put them out. So that's right. It, it, it was out for comment until the eighteenth of December in twenty twenty. Yeah, and they're still and they're still not public, are they? No. Um, and, and it's probably so, because we've got them in court over the Golden Plains wind farm, and I would imagine they'll be waiting to see the outcome of that before they try their next trick. Um, look, I, I don't know. Do you know if the email still still works? Brogerwind.standardsreview at delwp.vic.gov.au. Let's put that out there. Um. Uh, I, I don't know if it'll still work. You're better off to write directly to Lily D'Ambrosio or John Bradley, the Secretary of yeah. Delp, John Bradley. He's probably uh, the li key one. You can find Lily on Twitter. Um, uh, I know they monitor and, her account pretty closely. You can, um, you can find John Bradley on Twitter too. Can you? Okay. I'll, yeah. I'll, yeah. I, will, I will tweet him out later in the, uh, in the day. Hamish, Del please tweet. Please secretary. tweet me the, the the. Please tweet to me what you would like me to to put out later in the day, and and I shall do. Um, but please, in your discourse with ministers and secretaries of departments and everything, be more polite than me, <laughs> please. <laughs> uh, um, I'm, Hamish, I'm accused of being very blunt. <laughs> I just get a bit ranty and sometimes a bit sweary. I can't, I can't help it when I'm so, uh, get so angry. I, look, um, but should I care less about the brogers? No, I bloody well shouldn't care less about the brogers, and all of us should be caring more, um, and keeping an eye on these processes. Um, uh, you know, we've got them now. We have to operate within them, and. Um, and if you care, you've got to, you actually have to do something. And in an election period like we're in now is the time when everybody's antennas are acutely attuned to what people are saying. If you live in the Western districts of Victoria and you care about brogers, tell Dan Tian that you care about brogers. Um, if you don't live in the Western districts of Victoria and you care about brogers, um, tell your local representative that you care about brogers. Just get on Twitter and let them know. Send them an email if email's your thing. Get on their Facebook page or whatever. And 
support Hamish. Support Hamish's GoFundMe. Put in Brolgers and you'll find it. And what about your land care, community land care group or something? Hamish, do you want to give them a, a, a shout out? I'm sure they're doing good work, even if it's not about Brolgers. Yeah, yeah, they, they're good. It's uh, our local one here, I guess, is based around Lismore now. Um, so it's a fairly wide a wide uh, area. But um, yeah, they, they've done a number of things uh, for Brolgers. They've put in submissions, which we give them a hand if they need that, um, to uh, do some protection up on the Carambolic Road and um, a few other places. And yeah, they've got some, some fairly active members in the group that, uh, that do care, which is good. Great. Uh, Nature Glenelg Trust as well. Uh, Ian has uh, has pointed yep. them out. Um, the Green Swamp, go and have a look. And hey, if you're a budding ecologist um, or zoologist, botanist, biologist, and you want to hone up your skills and whatnot, there's people like Hamish who need your expertise and need your help. So hey, jump on jump on my Twitter at Bird Emergency. And you will see a lot of these people being highlighted. Get involved. Just get involved. You can't do everything. Just bloody well do something. Okay? Hamish, thank you so much for being part of the bird emergency. Ian, thank you for putting me in touch with uh, with Hamish. Dear listener, thanks for being part of the bird emergency. Hamish, what's your Twitter? That's just my name. Just Hamish Cumming. Easy, easy. Um, <laughs> thanks, everyone. Great to okay, talk thank, to you. Okay, thank you for your time. Thanks, Hamish. You're a bloody hero, mate. Good on you. See ya. Bye.